Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the Surviving the COVID Pandemic Women in SME series hosted by Sinelu Centre d'Innovation de Mumbashi and Clean Technology Hub in Nigeria. It's a partnership of, I should say, African brothers and sisters coming together to create knowledge and to empower uh, our communities. With us today, I'm sorry that you can't see my screen. I am not in a very good position to share my screen, but we're going to do this audio today. But the rest of the panelists are there and you can engage with them. And lucky enough for me, their beautiful faces are out there with you. So keep joining, keep inviting your friends to come on board. I will just um, welcome my friend and my colleague from Clean Technology Hub, Chirima. She's going to tell us a bit about uh, our hub and later I'll take on and talk about Sinulu and from there we'll kickstart the panels. Chirima, over it to you. Hello everyone. Um, good evening, pleasure to have you all here. My name is Chidima AGK and I'm the Senior Associate Environment and Climate Change at Clean Technology Hub. So um, at the Hub, basically, we are uh, a, a renewable energy and climate change, environment and climate change organization. We sit at the intersection of both and we focus on research, advocacy, um, engagement, as you see, and then building the capacity of women in renewable energy, supporting how, uh, uh, supporting them to build sustainable businesses. Uh, we also support, outside of women, we also support uh, tech innovations for young people who, who are entrepreneurs in clean energy, supporting their innovation. So we run incubation programs. We have one currently running at the time uh, in partnership with Olon. And um, we are looking to see how we can support them to be able to scale their businesses. And for this program, this is our first with Sinolu, and we want to use this platform to also bring women into this space, considering the times that we are in, uh, how we can support women to be able to build sustainable businesses and be able to survive this period because we understand how challenging it can be. Um, so this is us in a nutshell, and we don't want to take much of your time. We believe you're going to be having further engagement and you get to know more about us and we get to know more about you. So thank you and um, have, a, have an interesting session. All right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Chidima. Thank you, Chidima, for that. Uh, well, Chidima, uh, like she talked about their hub and the work that they're doing with women, is also something that we at the uh, Sinodu are very passionate about: female entrepreneurship, especially in Africa. And we understand that the voices of female entrepreneurs is not being it's it's not yet being heard enough in Africa. We're not being properly represented in terms of policies and all of that. That is why this is the first step in a line of activities that we will be collaborating together in order to ensure that we make our own contribution to women fulfilling or achieving their full uh, economic uh, potential. Um, we at the uh, Centre de Innovation de Mumbashi, we are based in the DRC for those who are joining us from Nigeria. We're based in the DRC and we are an innovation space and a business incubator. So we have about 20 startups that are in our incubation program and we kind of take them through from ideation right up to acceleration. Mm -hmm. And we also have a program that is dedicated just for women, Femme 360, si on traduit ça en anglais, c'est Women 360. So on that uh, platform, we focus on women, sorry, excuse me, women entrepreneurs, and we look at women and girls in STEM. We want to encourage a lot more women and girls to go into technology. And we also want to see a lot of female entrepreneurs using digital tools and technology tools to boost and grow their businesses. As we'll be going through these talks, you kind of see that this agenda comes forward as we both, uh, Clean Technology Hub and Sinolu, we believe that technology as well is also, is, is, is the future basically. And most businesses, we need to start thinking of that future, incorporating technology into our business models and all of that. So that's it. Uh, that's Sinolu in a nutshell. 
during the conversation, we'll be dropping uh, our handles and websites in the comment sections. You can visit our pages. I think you must be watching from one page. You can like to keep the conversation going. Uh, Chidima will just give us a brief introduction on of the speakers that we have here today. And I must say that this is my first panel, no, second, all women speakers. And it's, it's a big one for me. And I'm very happy that there are a lot of strong women who are here to make their voices and their opinions heard. Uh, Chidi, over to you. You can introduce the speakers. Thank you. OK. Um, hi, everyone, once again. Uh, so for the first panel, we have two speakers. We have Lady Soma Fidel Awerim and um, Ms. Oge Fulola Moody, uh, who is the CEO of Alternative Managers Limited and MSME Consulting company uh lady sorry okay is the former chief of staff dr emmanuel ibe kachuku the managing director of nigerian national petroleum corporation nmpc and subsequently the chief of staff to the honorable minister of state petroleum resources and coordinator of the ministry of petroleum resources uh, when dr kachuku was promoted prior to that appointment in 2015 she was the managing director, CEO of NOI Post Limited for three years, during which the company won various awards of excellence. She was the manager of corporate venturing and incubation at SFS and part of the core team that managed the financial services portfolio over 5 billion USD of the standard trust group of companies, now UBA. When he has uh, when his allies were dissolved to form Next Zone, she was instrumental in designing the Next Zone Business Incubator, which granted a grant from the World Bank MSME program. On her return from her business school in 2008, she joined Makeda Fund Managers Limited Liability, Co Limited Liability Company as the fund director for West Africa, where she directly managed a, USD, a 550 million USD SME private equity startup fund which focused on investing in women entrepreneurs across Africa. In 2009, she founded a company called Alternative Managers, an SME-focused consulting company that has partnered with the Ford Foundation, the Nigeria SME Agency Sweden, Leap Africa, and Faith Foundation to build the capacity of SMEs and stakeholders in the sector. She earned the bachelor's a Bachelor of Science degree with honors in economics from the University of Nigeria and Suka, and uh, an MBA degree from the Cranfield School of Management in the USA. So, Ogen is a published author, teacher, writer, blogger, public speaker, radio host, and an avid golfer. She is the founder of Wellsprings of Life Global Outreach, Kairos Knowledge Center, School of Influence, and the First Bond Foundation. Uh, we're pleased to have you, Ma. Thank you. We're pleased to have you. Okay, do we have Miss? Do we have uh, Miss Yeah, yes, we I'm do. Here. Okay, hi, hello, Ma. Hi, <laughs> pleasure to have <laughs> you. All right, I'm going to tell you. Thank you. I'm going to tell you uh, a, lit, uh, a little about Lady Isioma. So she's an international business consultant who has worked as a marketing manager for the Indonesian Trade Promotion Center. She held managerial roles at the Amalgamated Plastics Industries Limited and Hanover Home Loan and Savings Limited. Former business development manager with the Center, or Center for Law and Business and Executive Secretary at the Nigerian Belgian Chamber of Commerce. She is currently oh, the director of She's so, currently yeah. the director of international business for Showground Energy Limited, managing partner of Ed and Greg Total Wellness Limited, and executive director of thirty year of a thirty year old seat of wisdom primary school. She is a member of the board of trustees and the public relations officer of Women in Renewable Energy Association. Uh, sorry. Of Women Renewable Energy Association, YRA. Lady Tioma is a transformational public speaker and is honored to have anchored many events in the past 25 years. 
we are pleased we are pleased to have you here ma thank you so much but a point of correction 16 years at the Emb embassy of the republic of indonesia and four years at the indonesian trade promotion center i work closely with ambassadors and uh, diplomats thank you very much all right thank you ma'am um, so I'll leave it over to Grace, Ms. Grace, to take our first panel. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chidi, for that introduction. Um, so today, the topic for today's uh, conversation is, uh, is surviving the COVID for women in micro, small and medium enterprises. and. Okay, with your work that you've been doing with female entrepreneurs and consulting for M uh, for MSMEs, I just want you to first of all just give us like your view. How do you think that things are going on right now in that sector? How difficult is it? And just like a general overview of, of, of what you think is the situation is like now for female entrepreneurs in the MSME sector. Okay, um, overview, uh, really tough times. Um, this is a business risk that you have no control over. Um, the sure. pandemic has come and, um, I mean, no one really expected it to be this tough. Uh, the lockdown also didn't help because uh, you have to shut down businesses, almost stop operations of your business. Um, purchasing power, which is the pocket share of your consumer, has you know, more or less dwindled because people are saving up on cash, not knowing what next, you know, uh, people are losing jobs and no one is really sure which way or which turn uh, the economy will take. So it's really tough times for the women and everyone really that has a small business. And I think the key thing is how do we survive this time and come out on the other end much better for it? Yeah, so 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 uh, we just you're just mentioning uh, some of the risk, and it's actually a risk that nobody prepares for because this happened and it just came in our faces. I think it was happening in Europe and China and India, and I think somehow Africans we felt that we were immune, and then suddenly it hits us like a bomb, and we have this crisis to face. Uh, little Isioma, can you just briefly explain to us some of the risks that uh, this female led? businesses especially in the SM, msma sector are exposed to at this time across within your community and you think uh, across the pan-african community as well lady are you, are you there with us uh i think we're having connection issues are you there okay Internet in Africa. This is another issue that we'll be tackling later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Which actually uh, is one of the things that we have to work on now because it's yeah, yeah. Now, the online community is growing much stronger. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, okay, so can you just take that question? Can you just tell us briefly? You were talking uh, earlier about the fact that we didn't prepare for this and all of that, and talking about purchasing power. Can you just? Highlight, for example, within your community, you've worked with these women. What are some of the risks that you think that they are more exposed to during this period? Okay, so um, there are about three key risks that, that they're exposed to. One is the financial risk. Under that risk, really, it's about uh, risk associated with cash and its equivalents. Um, so cash is king, uh, especially to a small business, because you would need cash to uh, run your operations. You need to pay salaries. And of course, you know, to grow and to penetrate the market. Um, so again, on the financial risk, you have, you know, your exposure to debt, your exposure to foreign exchange, especially if you're heavily dependent on importation as part of your value chain. So if some of your raw materials have to be bought in uh, US dollar, then you face that risk. Um, again, one of the risks also some of them face um, is that of liquidity. Um, now, if you're very cash dependent, if most of what you do, you, you buy your raw materials and you have to sell to grow your revenues, then you're cash dependent. So the, the minute that cash doesn't come in, then you have a liquidity squeeze. You're looking for money uh, to try and buy. And that's when either you start borrowing or you also need to pay back 
on some of the debt. <laughs> so the financial risk is a big one. Um, the second one is the reputational risk. And I know a lot of us don't really think about it, but small business go into contracts. Uh, there could be forward contracts. You know, you, you have agreed to uh, supply a certain amount of things to someone, uh, let's say maybe April or May, and then the shutdown comes in March and you're not able to meet that contract. Sometimes if you have a very unreasonable client, that could lead to, you know, all going on social media saying, look at this person was supposed to do this, they didn't do this. And then that, you know, once you face a reputational risk as a small business, it's really very difficult uh, to come out of that. Again, uh, another risk that is it's really, 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 is now this risk they face with the pandemic, uh, where you really have no control control of what can happen. Um, and so you do not know when you will open, you do not know um, when you can even actually start operations normally again. So these are things that, you know, the small business communities are really uh, complaining about um, the inability to sustain uh, salaries, inability to sustain uh, buying inventory, inability to uh, sustain or keep some contractual agreements. And again, uh, when are we going to open to start operation? So these are really uh, serious issues that they have, they're facing currently. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, Lady Shama, are you here with us now? Can you, can, can you hear us? And it's everything okay on your end. Would like you to come in? I, I don't know. Can you? Okay. Looks like she's still down. So, uh, like you were mentioning about uh, the financial risk and yeah. all of that, you know that especially when it comes to financing for small businesses it's an area that is a bit tricky because there's no divide sometimes within between uh personal and 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 yeah and yeah, business. Yeah. <laughs> yes yes oh okay can you, 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 you. can hear you very well oh okay thank you thank you for joining us um so um uh, like uh, your colleague Oge was just she was talking about financial risk and reputational risk that uh, businesses are exposed to, and even the foreign exchange and all of that. Um, I was just mentioning that when you even talk about financial risk, it's 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 a problem that it's a risk that these startups are exposed to even without the crisis, because sometimes the management of the finances uh, of that financing is a big issue. So what are some of the warning signs that you think that these businesses should be looking out for? Female entrepreneurs. So yes, um, Oge has listed the risk, but what are the warning signs that we should be looking out for? Did Ishima, can you take us on, on, on that question, please? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. We can hear Hello. you now. Yes, it's Yama. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So, sorry. Well, what was the question? We're talking about one some sign. of the warning signs. Yeah, Oge talked about, listed some of the risks that uh, these startups will be exposed to. And when we talk about risks, sometimes these entrepreneurs, maybe due to the capacity in terms of skills and all of that, they might not really understand. But so now for them to, for us to make it easier for them, what are some of the signs that they should be looking out for? When we see these signs, we should know that, okay, this is me already being exposed and then they should take action. What are some of those signs that they should look out for? Okay. Uh, I, okay. Maybe I, think I can she... take that question while we're waiting. Yes, for please. Yes, time. please. Okay. Yeah. So, so a sort a, a sure sign that you are in trouble is when you can't pay uh, for inventory or you can't pay salaries when you can't see cash. That's a sure sign that, um, and that could happen now because you're not making sales. Like I said before, if you are heavily dependent on cash and a lot of the money, a lot of what you do is a matter of, so let me take an example um, for someone who is in agriculture or agro-processing. So maybe you have a juice bar and a lot of what you do, you have to, so it's almost like once your store, your inventory comes in, it has to be converted to the set, to the product. Um, so you're not making sales and you have about maybe 10 uh, staff to pay. Um, the minute that you look into your either bank account 
and there is no cash, no liquid cash. And liquid cash means cash you can spend immediately. So not cash you have invested in other things or like your equipment, uh, those are your earning assets. So um, that's a sure sign that uh, there's trouble. When um, you can't pay back a debt. So I know that um, some governments have brought up uh, an emergency policy where they're asking or they're giving, especially for Nigeria, the Bank of Industry has said they will give a three month moratorium, but that's really on the principle. That means you have to be paying your interest. So when yeah. you see also that you can service your debt, that also is a problem. So once cash starts dwindling, that's a sure sign that uh, there is an issue. Um, I think that's the very first, and that's like a red flag that says, look, I'm in trouble and I really need to find out how I can conserve cash. Certainly if cash is not coming in as much as um, it is. I know that sales have fallen down to about 30 to 50% of what uh, small businesses used to make. Um, yeah. like I said before, it's because they've been shut down and then the pocket share of consumers have re reduced because everyone is saving on cash. So that's a sure sign, I think. Cash is king, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't know, like we're talking about this risk, even digitalization now has its risk because internet providers are not are not reliable and are not sustainable here yeah? because we can get uh informants connect. Uh while we're having this um this conversation with Oge, if you have a question, just drop it in the comment section and we'll be able to take it with her so that she can answer your question. So feel free to drop your question. Uh she's been talking on risk management. And we'll be taking shortly some of the strategies that can be put in place. We've talked about the signs to look out for. We've talked about the different uh, uh, forms of risk that businesses are exposed to. So if you have a question, please just drop it in the comment section and we will respond to that question. Uh, so, um, okay, like we were saying, so now you've talked yeah. about this sign. What strategies do you think that these businesses should adopt? Because now things, things, things are a bit critical because even when we design strategies now, we have two crises. There's a health crisis, there's an economic crisis. In regular times when there was no COVID, Africa was already, our economies were already in a turbulent state. And then now with all of this, what strategies do you think that these startups and these women with businesses, given their unique nature, which is something that we have not really explored yet, which I don't know if you think it's a risk, because women as entrepreneurs, just their nature, that gender and the gender imbalances and all the cultural uh, dilemmas that we have to deal with in our community in itself is already a challenge. So I don't know if that challenge could become a risk for some people. I don't know if that... So, uh, so I, I like to think yeah. as uh, being a woman um, as an advantage, that has a lot to, to, to work on your psyche. Um, being That's like we've, we've dealt a lot with uh, women businesses across West Africa, uh, women are very good managers of business. I mean, it's, it's known everywhere. And True. you give a woman uh, a business and she feeds an entire community. Um, so it's a great advantage um, having women as entrepreneurs. Um, they are very, um, although they're risk averse, you know, they don't take risk easily. But I think that they are really great managers. And I think there is no better time than now for women to show their great managerial skills in, in this crisis. Um, so um, when we look at different things they can do, like I mentioned initially, this, this pandemic really um, was something that came suddenly and most people didn't really prepare for it. But I would like to go before the pandemic and say that there are some risks that both small and big businesses face. And it's not just because um, of size, but just because of the entire environment. Now, small businesses suffer more impact and women do because uh, of the smallness of the business, the access uh, they have to smaller resources. And of course, the equity cushion is not as big. Um, so you have these business risks are the same to both large and small businesses. Now, what's important is risk management. Um, I think that one key lesson uh, we should learn after the COVID is how to plan well. Um, when you yeah. have a business, you have to be able to plan around the business, around what I call the pastel factors. So pastel is politics, economics, uh, the social, uh, social uh, issues, technology, 
the environment and legal. Uh, small businesses should take research and planning more seriously. And I think that yeah. way they can start to mitigate against this risk in terms of any kind of strategic risk they'll face. They also, like they say, it's when you prosper, you don't really see a lot of problems. So when you prosper, you save money. And I've talked about investments. Mm -hmm. So small businesses, when a lot of cash, rather than being so liquid, when you have a lot of cash, you feel, oh, I have money and there's so much. Take some of that cash and put it away so that when the bad times like this come, then you can bring out that cash and start to spend. Um, and so that's very important. Then you must also take a look at reputation. How are you building your business on social media? Like you talked about the online, the internet is the easiest and cheapest way to be able to project your business, your interaction with the customer, customer engagement. Um, there's something I talk about, uh, storytelling, the customer, the experience you give customers. Um, and so you can mitigate against reputational risk by engaging your customers online, uh, using all the social uh, media platforms to you know, create uh, an experience for your customers. Then you can then look at uh, the business interruption risk and plan, put together what I call a business continuity plan. If today um, a flood comes in, what happens? If today a pandemic happens, how does your business continue? If today someone dies, how does your business continue? So I put together, because um, I can see maybe time is going, I put together what I call risk in terms of how to advise small businesses, R-I-S-K. I like, you know, in acronyms. Now, the R <laughs> yeah. is reinvent yourself, reinvent your business. The I is insurance, insure. S is shred. K is keep in touch. Um, so, yeah. So reinvent means that you have to find better ways of doing your business. So when you're looking at your value chain or the services around your business, and I'll take, for example, someone who does food catering. Now, if you've been doing food catering for events, the pandemic obviously will be impacting your business in a very negative way. There are other mm. things to do. You can do the food delivery, you can do the takeout, you can offer your clients a whole range of things around your main product, which is making food. So you invent yourself, you look at your inventory, um, you have to be able to do things that are different. You have to be able to look at things which you can innovate on and become different with, even within the same thing. Then I go to the I, which is insurance. A lot of things we don't do in Africa is insurance. And so um, there was a time we did uh, research and it was one out of 10 Nigerians were like, they don't need to insure anything. But I'll give you an example. Um, the tennis tournament, Wilbindham, was doing after SARS, in 2003, they started insuring it was about 1.7 million pounds every year uh, against the pandemic. Now they have an, a payout from the insurers. I mean, they're still making a loss because they have shut down the tournament for this year, but at least they have a payout of 114, I think, million pounds. Why? Because they insured mm -hmm. against a pandemic. They had the foresight too. Now I tell small businesses, you need to insure your equipment, your property, Ensure your employee, employees, you know, employee liability insurance. Ensure every single thing you can. Sit with someone, a uh, brokerage, uh, an insurance agent, and let him know the risks that you have and what coverage that you can assess to that. Insuring means that you will not, even if there is a pandemic or there is a sudden interruption to your business, you will not suffer complete loss. Then shred, which is the S, uh, meaning shred your costs. These are the hard decisions. Um, in this short time that we've all been locked up, a lot of us are doing different weight, um, uh, weight loss uh, activities. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is jumping on the treadmill. Everyone is working out. Yes, so we're trying to shed the excess fat. But you know what? Uh, after a month, I stopped losing weight. Weight. I'm doing the same things, but I'm not losing weight. Then I realized I have to make the hard decisions of doing the what you call the heat exercises, the high intensity, intensity. exercises. Yeah. Exactly. But you have to do that to be able to <laughs> yeah. get lean. So small businesses, you have to shred the fat. It's the hard decisions, the things you don't like, letting go of staff, cutting the costs that don't matter, cutting, you know, shrinking your costs so that you can have at least a bit more cash so that when the COVID is over, you can have some money to start or to push your business. So 
uh, just in time inventory, getting really lean with your business. And that is a shred in the fat. And then the last one I call keep in touch. Now I've mentioned that the pocket share of your consumer is very tight. They will remember you if you send them messages. How are you doing? This is what we're doing. For instance, I keep saying if you're a food person, send them messages about nutrition. You're indoors. Don't eat too much carbs. Eat your protein. Eat this. Eat that. We can deliver this to your house. You no, know, but just keep in touch. And that's more like networking. You're keep in touch with your distributors. Keep in touch with those you buy your raw materials from so that when it is time for you to ask for discounts, ask for extended credit, ask for different things from them, they will remember that you remembered them during the crisis. So that is it, um, managing your risk as a small business. Oh, that was, that, was, that was very insightful. That was very insightful. And when you spoke about insurance, um, in, in, in the DRC, actually, I think it was just uh, last year that we opened up the insurance sector to the to open the insurance industry to the private sector, which means that now a lot of insurance companies privately owned are coming into the scene, which is a good opportunity for female entrepreneurs here in the DRC to visit these insurers and look at how best to plan for the future. Because in Africa, it's a clear fact. People feel like when you tell them to plan for life insurance, you want them to die. It's not superstition. Just plan for your business in itself. It, it goes a long way, like the, like the example um, Ms. Oge gave. Uh, I've been asking people to drop their questions. It's rather unfortunate that um, Ms. Um, Isioma, Lady Isioma could not, could not participate. These are some of the challenges that we will have to face as an African economy and that policy makers and even us as citizens, we need to start talking about in more infrastructure needs to be looked at on a very serious level in Africa. Um, Ms. Ifoma Malu, I'm just gonna project uh, her question. She said, uh, women have huge problems assessing soft financing or even financing of any kind. So are there any other ways to plan for these risks that don't involve spending money? I, th I think some of the strategies you mentioned don't involve spending money, but just reiterate so that uh, those yeah. who are not here can 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 just benefit. Of yeah. course, in reinventing yourself, what you're looking for are um, collaborations along your service delivery line. You know what you're doing. Um, so, for instance, if you have a health and fitness expert, for instance, Ladisha, I saw that she's a health and fitness expert, and you're a juice or a healthy food. Uh, um, a distributor, so you have juices of that. You can actually say, oh, do you know what? Let's work hand in hand and let's deliver a service. So aside my juices, can I deliver nutrition or healthy tidbits? So in that way, I, I try to build uh, consumers far beyond just what who comes into my shop to the health conscious, those that are very concerned about their health, those that are concerned about the children's health, those that are concerned about the family health, I'm building that, having a fitness and a health expert beside me, we're giving health tips. So I'm not just selling a product, I'm now selling health as a service. Um, then I can say, okay, um, I am an educator. What I do, maybe I teach and maybe I'm home now. Hello. Um, I could also work with someone who, maybe like a, a graphics designer. And now this, like I said, keeping in touch, this is about collaboration. So you're looking for people who are willing to collaborate with you and not you know, definitely asking, give us money, give us that. So you can say, oh, let us do a graphic illustration of some of the things I teach and send to the parents or so they can get across to their children. Um, so collaboration for me is key before the money. Now, um, what's important is trying to think beyond your product, beyond your service. You are looking at other options around you that are still tied into your main product. And you're thinking, how can I serve this person better? I'll give an example. Now that COVID has come, a lot of things have shown up in Africa. Education, health, agriculture. Now, if you are in any of those sectors, what you should be thinking is, how do I make myself relevant 
in this period and beyond. There's so much resource. And that's why I say research and planning is so key. Because what a lot of our small businesses will face after COVID is what you call the strategic risk. And I've talked about Pestel, which is looking at all those factors and saying to yourself, how is the world going to look politically? How is the world going to look economically? How is it going to look socially? Um, how do I make sure my business is prepared to go forward um, with technology, with the environment, and legally, how do I make sure that my contracts going forward protect me when there's such a disaster like this? So there are many ways um, you can actually start to plan how to grow your business beyond the money. I think money is just one aspect, uh, but strategy is very key in keeping you alive. Yeah, that's true. Um, we have a comment. We have uh, questions on people asking how to contact you. So you, um, she's going to drop like all her business information and website on the comment section. She did not beating me up for time somewhere. <laughs> I have to see what we see for time somewhere for the next panel. But okay, it's been really great exchanging with you, and I think you've raised some valid points. Fortunately for all of us, this is still going to be running on the Sinolu page and the Clean Technology Hub page, so you can always go back there and watch the video, and we'll also publish it on on uh, YouTube. Lady Sioma is joining us almost at the end of the panel. Hi, this has been oh my goodness. I just quickly say something on the warning signs. But I yes, want to yes. say something to, to us wonderful ladies. Many of us, many entrepreneurs from interviewing them, many are getting depressed because they've lost a lot of money. They didn't mm. expect this. I mean, the world, the economy has disrupted and so many things are happening. The only person you should try to be better than is that person you were yesterday. We need to form a, a, a front, a collaborative synergy to help each other. One thing I noticed, a lot of us entrepreneurs were too hands-on. We were the accountant, we were the marketer, we were everything. And it caught most of us aware or um, unawares. And what happened is they were so confused. They didn't know what to do and, and they felt depressed. And going forward, we must plan ahead and find out and, and prepare for such un unforeseen risks. It's an absolute must that you find out what the three non-negotiables are that must, you must um, uh, focus on absolutely in your business. Is it the invoicing? Is it the paying bills? because the, some found out that they couldn't pay their accountants, their salaries and things like that, and, and they resigned and they were caught unawares. Another one in sign is leaky profits. Once you notice your margins are low, it's a one in sign. Learn to, to monitor your margins, track them, get an accountant. And you also should, should try and understand basic accounting. You know, keep your systems, um, um, keep your accounting systems um, um, together, you know, look at your gross profits, look at, at the end of, of the month or at the end of the year, you know, this could help you. And another thing is quality and not quantity. Many mm. business persons are doing so many things at the same time. You can't be everything to everybody. There are a lot of services now, you know, find out the essential things. If you're, if you're dealing with like 10 products, Look at three, for example, that are very essential. Review these and plan ahead. Streamline, probably have about mm. out of the 10, you know, um, products. So these are warning signs. We're caught unawares. There's also the giving too many discounts. I have that issue. Because I want to make money, you find out you sell something to somebody for 3000 or 10000 Another person comes and says, oh, I want to buy, you know, and because you need the money, you give them a discount. This is a warning mm -hmm. sign because they know that they are manipulating you. Go mm -hmm. back to the drawing board and find out what you could do. There's, you know, I talked about this decreased margins as well. Also, make sure that your products fall within the essential category. Now, many people are out of business, but some were very wise. They immediately did what you call a pivot. They transited to some other business, like some started making masks. Some started making, um, uh, what do you call this? The antibacterial, the sanitizers, you know? So we must come together as women to help each other. And when you don't have a mentor, that's another warning sign. 
You know, you need to have someone who's probably done business for many years and you can get advice from such people. I heard somebody talking about collaboration. Collaboration is very key it right is. now at this time. Yes. And then many of us are not digital. We need to change our mindset. I invited a friend of mine to be a part of this um, amazing international business. And you know what she said to me? She, she's, she's good at her business. She says, oh, that, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, savvy like all of you. I said, it's just a Zoom. Just download the Zoom. And I told her what to do. And thank God she believed in herself finally and mm. downloaded Zoom. And she said to me, wow, you mean it was as easy as that? It's a warning sign when you're not abreast of the digital trends. Oh, thank it's you. To, thank you. Know, look you. Into thank this. you. Thank um, you. I don't know if uh, you have another uh, question. No, you, you've come in and you've added to what uh, Ms. Oge has said, and I think that that was very balanced on, on, on the risk end. And something that has keep coming, that has been coming over and over, that I think we'll still bring again in, in, in the second panel, digitalization and, and, and collaboration. But thank you so much. Please join, you can go to the comment section and drop your business information and website, Facebook pages and all of that so that the participants can can contact you or contact your admin staff and, and all of that. Uh, thank you very much, Oge. So, for your that I, in so I couldn't really handle all those other questions, but I'm sure we'll have this yeah. again sometime. You know. Oh, definitely, definitely. We'll, we'll plan a second session. We'll definitely plan a second session. This is the no, first of many. Know. Yeah. Um, Chidi, I don't know if you're there with us. You can introduce the second uh, topic. And thank you, Oge. Thank you, Lady Shoma. And thank I think you. we'll bring you guys back towards, towards the end. Thank okay. you. Great. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, Chirima, are you there? Hi, hello everyone. Okay, hello. so for the second session, yes. So for the second session, we are going to be looking at uh, SME adaptability and management. Okay, and we have uh, we have we have other panel. We have. Um, it's in Kem Dilim Waje. All right. Hello, Ma. Can you? Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. The name is in Kem Dilim Waje. Okay, she's the digital transformation and marketing expert and the CEO at Future Self. Now, could you tell us a bit about yourself? All right, my name is Nkem Dilim Owaje Beo, actually, not just Owaje, um, and I am the CEO of Future Soft, um, an IT service company um, in Lagos, Nigeria, where we focus on um, digital marketing, e-learning, and IT consultancy with a core focus on digital transformation. Um, I founded the company 12 years ago, and we've basically um, evolved over the years into you know the form that we are today. Um, it's been really interesting times, I think, for, for our organization these last um, you know eight, eight to ten weeks. And um, you know, the world is finally moving digital and it's very, very exciting for me to see. It's something that I've been advocating for for many years, you know, um, and and I'm glad that it's finally happening. Obviously, the circumstances are not ideal. However, I think that especially for the African continent, the current situation will mean a drastic shift and can also lead to a lot of economic um, value being created. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ma. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you. And uh, the second panelist will be Ms. Grace. <laughs> sorry. So, uh, yeah. Grace Aluchi, sorry. Grace Aluchi is a business management consultant and she's a hub manager at Sinelu. We are pleased to have you, Grace. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think everybody has heard my voice a lot. And so I, I think I've technically introduced, introduced myself. You see my, 
agenda and everything and the way I'm going. Um, so my name is Grace Oluchi and I work in DRC for Centre d'Innovation de Mumbachi. Um, I'm a management consultant and for the last seven years I've been working with uh, project project management and capacity building across Africa and working especially with, with, with small businesses, with startups. Uh, I think that's a good summary. That's a good summary. Working especially with startups, and this year we're trying. I'm trying to move my focus from just working generally with startups to female to to, to, to female led uh, businesses. That which is why it's very interesting to see that almost everybody on this uh, series is a business owner. It's 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 very exciting. It's very amazing for me to just exchange and rub minds with these people. Yes, Chidi. Over okay, to you. Um <laughs> All right, thank you, Grace. So we are going to be looking at um, we are going to be looking at uh, SME ad small and medium scale enterprises adaptability and management, right? Um, this is this is a time that no one has really experienced. I know that we have faced recession and all of that, but this is a very unique situation that a lot of people are not prepared for. So we are confused. We don't know which way to go, what to do, and all of that. So in this session, we are going to be looking at how small businesses can survive. Should they pivot? Should they uh, rework their? Should they look at changing their business models and all? I think I'm going to start with that. So what do you think they should be looking at at this point? So what think uh, business models should be looking at this point? And I would like to hear uh, views both from you, Grace, and uh, Ms. Kendlin. I'd like to know what you think about this. Uh, okay. Uh, for me, basic, uh, my answer is depending on the business model you had before and the strategies you had in place for your business, definitely, I think that based on my experience working with female entrepreneurs, most of them should consider actually changing their business models at this time and like kem was saying she's been advocating for for digitalization one of the first things that businesses need to start looking at is how can they make their businesses more digital creating a digital business model your business model now you should be looking at digital digital revenue streams and 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 virtual marketplaces and all of that definitely they should be looking at, at changing uh their business model Kim, I don't know what you, you, you have to add to, to what I just said. Yeah, so I completely agree. Um, and, you know, that would have been my answer as well. I think just to add to it, I would say that this is also the time to really invest in your digital marketing and in your brand building and really figure out how do you build a more solid brand that has a solid digital footprint, right? Um, there are a lot of brands right now that are brick and mortar and they can't really pivot as much as they would like. Let's say a spa, for example, right? What are the services that a spa can offer that is sort of not um, in their location, right? It, it makes it really, really hard for them. But yeah. what you can do is to actually use this time to build loyalty, to, um, you know, sort of make sure that they are creating content that is adding value to their customers to um, you know, extend their digital footprint to also review their processes, right? So I think that making sure that your processes are leaner, are faster, more efficient is really something that you can do with the time that you currently have if you know, you're not able to fully operate your business and really streamline those processes and optimize them so that you actually have, you know, less expenses, less operational expenses um, overall. Figure out, you know, what can you also do to sort of make your customers feel safe when they do come back to your brick and mortar? Because some businesses simply do not have an option than to wait um, until they are able to sort of open up again and, and you know, deliver their services. Just make sure that you're ready when that time comes, right? Um, and in all of it, I think, um, don't forget your employees as well, you know, keep them motivated, um, you know, sort of pump up the morale, make sure that they are not at home getting completely depressed or looking for another job or something, right? You want to make sure that they stay loyal. You want to make sure that they, you know, feel like we're in this together. You want to make sure that they support you the same way that you will support them. 
you know, and, and just another thing I would say is look at your, your, um, your, your cash, right? How much money do you have? How far can it take you? What are the key investments that you can make so that you can hit the road running when you get back on your feet? So those would be my my sort of additions to it. But definitely, um, you know, if you can pivot, pivot, um, even if it's just for a an interim temporary solution. Yeah, which was what I was going to add in terms of even if you 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 have business structures that cannot permit you to digitalize, you can think of creating new products, even just for, for the meantime, just to keep yourself afloat, just to keep your employees employed and just keep that entire value chain and that system and that system running. Hello, Grace, are you there? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so um, like I, I think this may be uh, new for some of the participants. Can you give like specific, um, like paint a specific picture, take a, uh, like tell like a, a story that people can connect with more that will emphasize like tools that they can use to um, really, really see a flip at this point. You understand because I, 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 a lot of people are not as connected as the others. So, um, how can they, um, like, let there be something tangible they are going to be taking out of this? That okay, as I am living now, this is one thing I can immediately jump on in terms of uh, modifying my processes. What tools can I begin to build into my business? Right? You could just uh, share uh, like a, a story or something. So I think it's not necessarily about specific tools. Um, and I think that that's really where a lot of people get digital transformation really, really wrong. Um, I think it's more about looking at your customer journey, right? Looking at the touch points, looking at how you engage the customer, and then looking at where is their friction on that journey, right? What are the things that the customer um, you know, sort of has to go through in order to buy my product or to, you know, engage with me or ask questions. And I think it's really, really key to sort out those friction points. And those friction points may have nothing to do with technology, right? The friction points could be as simple as you don't respond fast enough, right? So I was trying to buy some nail polish a couple of um, days ago and, you know, I messaged multiple different vendors. One of them responded three days late, right? Um, and you know, then I said, okay, they then confirmed that they had the product. Then you know, I said, okay, can I see the colors? Then they told me I should come to their store, right? And this is all in intervals of every time it took like a day or two days or three days for them to respond. Yeah. So by the time they finally said, oh yeah, we are happy to send you pictures on WhatsApp. I said, I don't need them anymore. I've already bought the polish. My nails are painted, right? Um, so it can be something as simple as simply you know, looking at those processes and becoming more competitive for where the market is headed, where, you know, you have to be um, available 24 seven, you have to respond within minutes in order to close the deal, right? So I think that it's really about customer experience. It's about looking at your internal processes and thinking about how you can automate those processes so that you need less human power um, and, and less sort of human error as well that can be introduced. And that you really think about what do I you know, want in terms of, or what can I sort of shave off in terms of my bottom line, right? Because sometimes there's software that can do the work of five employees. So at the end of the day, when you are looking to automate and you're looking to sort of digitally transform, you have to look at your processes, you have to look at the customer experience before you select the tools. So there's no tool that I can say out of the box, this is gonna work for you, right? Mm -hmm. One business may need an accounting system, the other business may just need a smarter and faster and more millennial person handling social media, right? One person may need a website overhaul while the other person may need something completely different, right? So I think that the first notion to get out of your heads is the fact that there is a technology solution that is one size fit all. This is completely wrong and you know there's nothing like that. Nothing like that really exists. So it's really, really key to understand 
that the technology has to be tailor-made for your organization, for your business needs, has to align with the goals that you have for your business and, you know, and, and has to be useful for you and has to also be user-friendly for the people who are going to use um, the technology that you're deploying. Uh, yeah, Kim, Kim made some very brilliant points. There's no one size fits all. Uh, something that I always tell clients is the fact that just like each hum, every human being has their unique DNA, businesses as well has have their 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 unique uh, DNA. There's no solution that because it worked for X is going to work for Y. As a business, you have to reevaluate your entire operational process. You have to go and look at your lean model, your business model that you created at the beginning. Now you need to bring it back to the table and reevaluate it. Who are the partners? Some of your partners, some of your key partners might need to change given the situation that we are in right now. You need to change your partners. You need to look at your resources. Resources are being depleted or maybe they need to change change and basically just going back to the drawing board looking at the business model you drafted at the beginning if you have not drafted a business model this is not just something that we do for fortune 500 companies no no matter how small your business is you should design a model for that business it always gives you that cushion to go back and reflect and come back and go it's true that now we have to act on impulse and everything but like Oge was saying in the first panel planning is something that is very important and when you plan and you understand that unique nature of your business you're able to know what digital solutions and what uh, uh general operational strategies you should be implementing in order to remain sustainable during this time All right, that would be great. So, but um, looking at women SMEs, because they are our focus here now, do you see any way this affects them, uh, especially considering the delicate nature of women-run MSMEs? Do you see how this whole uh, adapt uh, adaptability, how this transformation, how, uh, how it affects them and what they should pay particular attention to? Well, yes, of course, women are mothers. We have so many roles that we play. We are mothers, we are wives, we are daughters at the same time. And when you're an entrepreneur, adding to that makes it becomes a little bit challenging. And we have kids not going to school. You're at home with kids. You're trying to run a business. All of that can be very, very challenging. And statistics also show that a lot of female entrepreneurs are not digitally inclined, which means that this shift to digitalization is going to be a major challenge for them. Learning to, 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 to just become digital, having a Facebook page and all of that. I think Chidi can bear with me that we have some, we had some challenges just getting people to connect on Facebook. Mm -hmm. We are like, mm -hmm. the app, download the app, create an account. Just that in itself shows you that women especially female entrepreneurs are not very digitally inclined. And now is the time for them to start thinking, to, to start thinking. And I understand that sometimes we dealing with the kids and husband and family and all of that, it could be challenging to respond to clients on the go, but find something that works for you. It could be a niece at home who has like five uh, Instagram accounts and fake Instagram accounts that we don't catch them drinking. Just that alone give that niece the charge of just replying to your messages on Facebook, on Instagram. That's a strategy that will work for you because they are more um, inclined to go digital than, 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 than us. Uh, all right, ma'am. Um, Mr. Kiamu, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so I, I completely agree. And I think digital skills are you know really important. And I think this is the time where you just need to find the time to invest in in, in yourself, right? Um, digital is not going anywhere, and we've just gotten to a stage where it's been even more accelerated um, than before, which means that you have to be able to play that game, and technology is the only way that you will be able to participate in this new world. So it's really, really important. And, you know, I've had a lot of women, um, you know, sort of call me, how do I connect on Zoom? How do I set up a webinar? How do I, you know, go on Microsoft Teams? How do I do this? How do I do that, right? And I think that part of it is, you know, sort of technophobia, um, which is very common in women, unfortunately. And I think we just need, all need to get over it, um, dive in head first, 
this, you know, technology doesn't break when you do the wrong thing. It just has an error. <laughs> and you can reset it. It will be fine, right? Um, so don't be afraid of it, right? And just engage, engage, engage. The more It's like riding a bike. The more you practice and the more you ride the bike, the more it becomes second nature and then you don't have to think about it anymore, right? I also think that, you know, um, a lot of women run businesses, especially micro and small businesses, will have problems um, actually investing into technology simply because they haven't paid enough in attention to their cash flow, right? Um, so I think that we also, as, as female-led businesses, need to understand that IT is not a cost center, right? Technology is not a cost center. It is an investment and we need to treat it that way, right? The same way that we would invest in a nice looking store or, you know, a nice looking, um, you know, salesperson. Um, and we would make sure that this store smells nice and all sorts of little nice touches that we'd like to do as women, right? We must also invest in our technology. And we have to understand that this is really critical to our businesses and to the growth of our businesses. And I think the, the thing that will allow us to do that is really a mindset shift. And I would say that in order to really understand, you know, what digital transformation is and, you know, how to position yourself, all women who are on this call should get a book called The Digital Transformation Playbook by David L. Rogers. He's a professor at Columbia University and that book is really transformative um, and it puts so many things into perspective and just shows you how many businesses died simply because they didn't take that leap of going digital. You know, and you don't want your business to, to be that, that one business that dies simply because you didn't take that um, step. So it's time to shift your mind. It's time to embrace technology. It's time to learn like your life depends on it. And it's time to invest. Uh, All right. Uh, Thank you. I, Thank I, you I, very I, much. Sorry, sorry, sorry for interrupting. I, I totally okay. agree with, 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 uh, with you, Clem. Uh, I like to say Google is your friend. Even if you're typing the wrong thing, Google is going to teach you how to type the correct thing. Google is your friend. Go on Google. Even if you don't know what Google is, there's voice activation. It's true that this white man and with our accent, sometimes they don't get to understand. But just keep trying. Just keep doing it. Technology is not going to break. And Chidi, I'll just help you with the questions. We have a question uh, from Ajoke. She's asking um, if in Africa, many women spend for um, business capital, okay. So basically what she's trying to talk about is business financing and personal financing, which was going to be something that I wanted to shed more light on. As women, sometimes we tend not to have separate, to separate the business from the person, which is also something that we need to start thinking of, especially, especially now. You need to be able to create an account for your business and you need to be able to have a personal account and pay yourself from your business, move those funds to your personal account and run your home from that personal account. There's a difference between capital and, and, and working capital. And when you start mixing it all up, that is why a lot of businesses crash. I think we're going to do another session on financial management for MSMEs because it's something that is really critical, especially for women. Uh, I would give the example of my mom, but I, I hope that she's not listening or watching from someone. Okay. <laughs> I watched my mom struggle as well because from her business fund, she will pay you transportation to go to school. She will feed you. She keeps taking, oh, mommy, I want a new dress. And she buys from, from the sales that she's made from her shop. And all of that, at the end of the day, she tells you she's not making profits and her business is about to collapse. Oh, no, she needs to take a loan to reinvest and all of that. No, no, no. You have to be able to do accounting for your family and accounting for your business. Those are two separate things. And women need to learn that. I think because we are so emotional and very empathetic, we don't want to see children suffer. We just keep moving funds left and right. If you want your business to grow, it's a habit that you need to stop. And if Oma wants us to talk about mental health, which I, I, I would throw back to Kem, I know that for a lot of people, it's very difficult in terms of uh, dealing with the stress and being depressed and all of that. Keep it moving you're not alone in this share your stories on facebook and all of that just keep talking about how you're feeling and know that at the end of the day there will be a silver lining to all of this 
even if your business closes, it's an opportunity for you to take the time to relax and maybe reinvent yourself and think of a new business model. I don't know, Kim, in terms of mental health and these women, they have to deal with managing their kids, their families and the businesses. In terms of mental health, what strategies do you have to propose that they the, the use to manage this? Um, so I think that the first thing is to, um, First of all, I think just be positive, right? Um, yeah. And surround yourself with positive people and guard your headspace. I think that that's really the most important thing. Stop watching CNN 24 hours, right? <laughs> um, stop reading all these forwards. Stop watching all these crazy videos. Guard your headspace. Without guarding your headspace, you will not be able to actually focus on your business, on the strategy that will take you to the next level, right? I think also find things that you love that you can do at home, right? Um, so for me, I think exercise has definitely been, you know, one of those things that has kept me sane and kept me, um, you know, grounded and, and, you know, sort of happy as well because it's something, you know, like um, you can see the results after a while and, you know, it, it makes you happy and even if it's hard. And there's lots and lots of great exercise that is online. I also think, you know, in these times, listen to more music, um, meditate, pray, um, you know, listen to audio books or read a book, whatever it is that, you know, sort of calms you down and soothes your soul. I think those are the things that are um, important. Hug your kids if you have kids, right? Um, and just be grateful for the fact that you get to spend more time with them and that you get to, you know, learn, you know, or get to know them in a completely different way um, because you're now suddenly their teacher. And, you know, as frustrating as that may be, you know, you will discover things about your children that you may not ever have been able to discover simply because you've never played that role in that way, right? So. I think it's really about adjusting your lens um, and looking at things from the bright side and, you know, sort of thinking about what is the future. And as I said, guard your headspace, um, invest in positive things, invest in yourself, use this time to learn, use this time to get ahead, use this time to think about, you know, other business opportunities, think about, you know, what else you can do. I think when you're busy, you don't realize, um, you know, how much time has actually passed, right? Um, I've been, I think I've been more busy than I've been in a very long time um, That's you know, true. in these last couple of weeks. And, you know, I can't really tell you how long I've been at home. Um, and I, you know, people are like, oh, don't you miss going out? I'm like, no, I'm way too busy. And I have so much work to do. I have no time to go anywhere, even if it was possible, right? Um, so, and, and but this is a function of when the pandemic started, the first thing I did was I looked at my cash in the bank and I said, how long can I run on this money without any income, right? And this was my business account, right? And I said, well, okay, we will be alive till the middle of June. Um, and then I said, which of my clients have the potential of not being able to pay their retainer fees simply because their clients won't be able to pay me, right? And then I now said, okay, if this is the amount of cash that is going to be missing from my balance sheet, what do I need to do in order to get other clients, new clients? And I focused on that, right? And I've accelerated business development to the point where, you know, we've signed, you know, more clients than, you know, we probably would have if this pandemic didn't happen simply because we've just been very focused we've been very you know aggressive as well um in in doing stuff so when you focus on your your business and you focus on your work and you focus on getting better and you focus on your employees and you don't focus on all the bad stuff that's going out on there going on out there then you will actually realize that the days just start passing and it's not actually as bad as you think right and by the time you look back, you realize that you've built yourself, you've built people around you, simply by being positive and by doing things that are positive, right? Um, so I think it's really about, you know, finding that positive thing in your life that will keep you afloat and that you can sort of replicate and do over and over again and guarding that headspace. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think there's a question on layoff. Well, one strategy that I know that has worked for me in the past is always treating your employees like family. 
Uh, I think Oge or Isioma mentioned that in the first uh, panel about the fact that reach out to your employees. I think even Kem talked about reaching out to your employees and engaging with them. The truth is everybody, even if employees are being treated well from the start, then they can share in the grief of the company. Sometimes laying off is not the only way, it's not the only strategy to, 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 to implement. You could reduce salaries, you could cut salaries and employees would understand. Some employees could even work for no pay just because they are dedicated to seeing that the, 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 the business grows. When you're a small business, sometimes you don't even have the, the, the resources to pay people $2,000 or $1,000 and all of that. You have to pay people small. So they have to understand that they are part of the process in growing that business. If your employees don't understand that from the start, especially when you're a small business, then you're making the mistake. And like Isioma was mentioning in the first panel, some of us as entrepreneurs, you watch yourself, you're the accountant, you're the cleaner, you're the marketer. No, 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 no. You have to be able to bring people together to understand that it is only together that we can build this. And talking in terms of strategy as well, this is the time to look at your partners. You need to be forcing creating new partnerships. We've created a group. Talk within yourselves in the group and see, for example, who has a model that is similar to mine. It is only together that we can win this. It's only together as women that we can grow our businesses. Collaboration, networks, partnerships, mergers are the way to go for the future if we want to grow big. So reach out, look at your partners, look within your community, who is doing a similar business to mine. Partnerships have conflicts, we understand that. But you have to learn to manage those conflicts and see who within my community can I come together with and build something that is more sustainable and that can see me through this time. So thank you, Chidi. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Um, I think with this, we've come to the end of this session. Okay, it was, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you, Ms. Grace. Thank you, Ms. Kim, for your time. All right, and with this, we'll move over to the next session. Um, we're going to be having uh, Ms. Ujumwa Ojemini and Melissa Tiko. And they are going to be talking to us about finance. We know that this is a big issue. This is, in our interactions with the ladies, I think this is one thing that everybody wants to, uh, everybody is curious about. That's the major issue with the finance and uh, with the economic situation of the country. Everybody wants to know, okay, how am I going to do this? Um, I, I, would you just, okay, uh, what's her name? Grace just answered the question on, people asking, should I lay off my staff and all. So here we're going to be discussing how we're going to be managing finance. And uh, yeah, I also have Rola K. Akinkube Filani, and I'm going to give you all some time to tell us a bit about yourself. Um, hold on. Sorry. All right, um, so we have Ms. Rolake. Could you tell us a bit about... So she, Ms. Rolake Akinkube Filani is the Managing Director of Energy Inc. She is the advisor and founder of INA Today. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, Ms. Rolake. Yeah, hello, hi. I hope everybody can hear me. Good to see everybody and Melissa and Ujunwa. Good to be on here with you guys as well. Thanks for having me, Chidi. Um, yeah, so I'm a finance and energy expert, been working to help businesses, both small and large businesses, raise capital in the market through types of seasons and also help them overcome some of the challenges and barriers to fundraising. So I, I look forward to talking about many of these opportunities and challenges on this discussion. Thank you. I think Chidima got disconnected for Internet connectivity, we've been talking about this <laughs> the entire session. Uh, Rolake, welcome. Melissa, welcome. It's good to have you. Um, I know Melissa is joining us. From <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, please. Melissa is joining us from, from Finca Ventures. Melissa, please, would you 
tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization and the work you do. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Melissa Tickle. Um, I'm an investment associate at Finca Ventures. Um, before I dive in with what we what we do, um, my background really has been in impact investing and SME lending, um, with a focus on the role that private capital can play, um, along with social entrepreneurship uh, to solve a lot of the world's big, um, developmental challenges. Think of Ventures itself. Um, we're an early stage impact investor. Um, we are based in Washington, D.C. in the United States, um, but our core focus is on supporting businesses in sub-Saharan Africa, mainly East and West Africa. Um, we're part of a much larger organization called Finca, um, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, it's a big microfinance network that operates around the world, really with a focus on um, access to savings and loan products for uh, lower income individuals. Um, Recently, our company, um, my part of that, has shifted to think about how we can be supportive of companies kind of outside of access to finance, but with other basic services. So think of ventures, invest in companies that are um, providing products and services to lower income individuals across agriculture, um, health, energy, and education are the main sectors. Um, and we, as I said, we're early stage investors, so we typically come in at the seed or series A stage of a company um, and then write check sizes between 100,000 and 500,000. Um, and my main role at Finca Ventures right now is really in deal sourcing and then I do diligence with uh, companies. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, would you <laughs> Sorry, would you are uh, please welcome on board. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? So hello everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with this brilliant women on this panel. Uh, my name is Ujumwa Ojemen, focused on impact investing and improving access to finance, specifically for African businesses, um, working with investors as well as um, entrepreneurs to be able to raise the finance the projects and for businesses. Um, in my previous role, um, I've been involved in actually raising funding for businesses as well as working with businesses to invest in those businesses, helping them in their strategy, their operations, um, after investing in them. Um, in other roles currently as an advisor with the private finance um, advisory network. Um, I'm involved in coaching businesses to help them raise funding to be invested in them. Um, on a separate note, I work with SMEs, especially female-owned SMEs, providing them with advice to as well as a microcredit, especially in Perry, Ghana, and rural areas. So I'm really excited to be on this panel because I know that funding for SMEs, especially for the SMEs, um, is crucial, is very important, and I'm looking forward to um, engaging for them. Um, at Parity Network, we have a group of women who are both in their careers as well as business. And so through the network, we help to provide them with um, information and resources to help them to be successful in their businesses. Looking forward to sharing more insights. No, oh, this has been amazing. It's just been amazing to listen to all of you and your incredible profile. So we're going to dive um, right straight into the conversation. I know that a lot of questions in the WhatsApp group that we had with the women who registered for this were mostly around financing during this difficult time. Financing is, a, is an issue all across Africa, especially for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. Why, for, um, I would like to start with Rolake, why do you think that financing is, is an issue? Is it because I know that banking, when we talk of financing, people mostly think of banks and MFIs. Outside look, looking, let's take away the banks and the MFIs. Why do you think that financing is an issue? Is it because of the nature of these businesses, their business models? What exactly do you think that are some of these challenges? Grace, I think for me, um, I will start with the point of how we view finance. So how MSMEs or SMEs view finance. And the thing is, finance is not just this instrument that you use because you want to fund a project. Um, I always like to think of it as an enabler. It's a means to an end, right? And so mm. when you're looking at finance, in any case, you should be looking at your business holistically. Where are you going as business? What are you trying to achieve? 
that's the first thing. The second thing is that in this day and age, the competition for finance is stiff, right? So as an SME as, or as an MSME or even a large growing emerging business, you need to differentiate when it comes to trying to attract finance or engage with investors. And one of the reasons you need to differentiate is exactly what you alluded to, Grace, is that it's no longer just about traditional commercial bank or corporate bank financing, right? Because there's a growing body of investors and not, a, not all of them take that typical banking hat where, okay, we make, have to make sure you have your collateral. We have to make sure that your target customer is there. But we're increasingly seeing that a pool of investors are much more interested in engaging with the entrepreneur and with management. So issues like corporate governance, your track record, your outlook, how strategic you are as an entrepreneur become even more important in this day and age, because let's face it, a lot of people do have assets they can leverage to trap funding. So the question I always ask businesses is, what is your long-term outlook? Where are you trying to get to? And how are you trying to make a difference in the industry ecosystem that you're in? So I think these are some of the reasons why this whole perception of finance needs to evolve. And the reality is that since the onset of COVID-19, um, the pandemic, which is now the new normal, and with a lot of SMEs trying to go into the market to raise funding, the first question is, let's look at your business. Let's look at the entire model of your business before we even think about raising finance, because nobody is going to give you money in this climate just for survival right? You have to have a strong business case. No one is issuing, I mean, there's specialist intervention funds that are like bailout funds, but if you're raising money in this climate, it can't just be to get by. It has to be because you see some huge industry opportunity down the line. You see a new market growing, you see a new type of customer base emerging, and you see a solid revenue stream down the line, and you want to leverage your assets to tap into that funding pot to build that model around what you see in the market. So I think these are some of the issues that we see in the market. And I would be quite keen to explore some of the specific opportunities there may be to access it and what you need to think about in terms of uh, crossing the hurdle to accessing that finance. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That was very insightful. Um, Melissa, given your experience with working with uh, businesses and uh, especially in the startup, or I should say SME, MSME sector, what would you say that are some of the challenges? Do you agree with Rolake? Are there other things to add in terms of the nature of these businesses? What are some of the challenges that they are facing in terms of accessing, accessing that finance? Yeah, I think, yeah, I agree with uh, Rolake's points. Uh, I don't have too much to add there. I, I would say um, given to her point as well, there are um, now a lot of different types of investors and lenders out there. Um, sometimes from an entrepreneur's perspective, it can be challenging to navigate um, the criteria of each investor, especially in the impact investing space. I don't, um, I like to give us some credit, but sometimes it's challenging to really understand from a sector, from a, ge a geographic, from um, a returns perspective, what, what certain investors are actually looking for. Um, so it can be sort of defeating when you're putting yourself out there and sending your pitch decks and keep on hearing back that your the business itself isn't aligned with um, with the investment thesis of a certain company. Um, so I think that's um, that's just a challenge, and it's more so on the investor side, just being very clear kind of what our expectations are um, when we're we're seeking a pipeline. Uh, okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, Ujunwa, I would like you to, to, to just briefly tell us what are the different avenues for financing that people should, that, that SM, women in, in MSMEs should be looking at? Because I know that most often we tend to focus on traditional banks and like Rola Care was talking about it earlier, it's not just about the banks anymore. What are the areas of financing that women should be looking towards? The different opportunities and the different sectors. And so. All right, thank you, Grace. Um, specifically for financing options, um, I think the first step would be for the business to look at what where they are, where are you in your business cycle, 
Um, so are you very early stage? Um, are you in your growth stage? Or where exactly are you? Um, that would typically inform the types of financing that you would need. Um, so for instance, if you're really in the pre-seed stage, so this is at the point where you're just trying to test us and then explore an idea or a business model just to test it out. Um, at that point, most times you would see that funding would usually come from yourself, um, family members and friends, and sometimes um, angel investors. So angel investors are typically sometimes high income individuals or sometimes groups that look at very early stage companies and provide them with financing. Um, at this point, you typically be looking for really small, so let's say in dollar terms, it might be about $25,000 at that point, $50,000. Um, they are really trying to raise, just to most times a pre-product, test out a product that you're thinking of or a prototype. Um, and then, in that state, typically we have an angel investor network um, across Africa and specifically in different countries. Um, there's one specifically that focused on women, and um, that's the Rising Tide um, network, and it's, um, it's focused on helping women to raise funding. So angels of women um, and helping women to grow their businesses, mentoring them, things like that. I mean, there are others in specific regions. So in Kenya, in Nigeria, there's the Lagos Angel Network as one of them. Oh, so thank you. Next stage is typically your seed stage where you're looking to maybe grow a bit more. And at this point, you're looking, you've started seeing early signs of revenue. Um, at this point, typically we have like um, VC, so early stage venture capitalists who want to sort of um, just maybe try out and see if this business is really going to scale. Sometimes also angels. And um, at this point, you're really going to potentially have to give up some level of or some parts of your business in terms of equity. Um, and then when you move over, when you start growing and um, when your business starts um, growing, you might then start looking at what people call your series A, your series B, series C. And at this point, you're looking at um, impact investors, um, just like um, Melissa said, who are looking for a double return, financial and social impact. And then you're also looking at private equity. Um, these are bigger organizations that want to actually provide hard funding. So I think looking at your business, you have to know where you are. Um, are you at the point where you're just really trying to start out and maybe even a grant would be more useful than the various sources of grants like the Development Finance Institution, the AFDB, um, the Bank of Industry in Nigeria? Or are you at the point where you can start taking on early stage angel investing or venture capitalists? Or are you growing where you want to now consider sometimes banks, if commercial banks can accommodate it, or um, bigger firms or bigger um, um, impact investors. One last one I would say is crowdfunding, which has become very popular. And this could be either debt or equity. And it just depends on, on what platform you're raising on. So there are different platforms. There's Kiva, there's Trine, and a few others. So um, it just depends on where you are in your business, what your business needs, and then determine who you're looking to. Or, but it doesn't have to be your regular loan from the banks, even though the rates are typically very high. Sometimes you don't yet have the cash flows to support it um, and things like that. Oh yeah, thank you. That 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 was insightful. Um, something that I I think I, I think is still in line with this. I know that you all have we have different landscapes in terms of investment in Nigeria and DRC. But I was with my experience. Sometimes it's difficult for MSMEs to raise funds outside of their ecosystem. For example, a company in DRC to raise funds from South Africa or America, sometimes it's difficult, especially when they have not been able to raise funds in their local country, in their local country. Do you think, Rolake, I would just direct this to you. Rolake, do you think that building an investment ecosystem and an investment culture is something that we even as entrepreneurs need to start thinking of for the future, creating venture capitalists, creating investment forums and all of that, being able, because our stock market system is still, you know, how it is in Africa. So is that something we should be looking at? Yes, thank you. Very, very pertinent question. And actually, you know, I want to also take it back down to the level of the individual. Um, and this is where the importance of actually growing and building your networks come in. Um, if you're an early stage entrepreneur, whether whatever gender, male or female, one of the things that is really going to help you unlock capital is your network. So I always recommend uh, 
uh, young up and coming female entrepreneurs. And, you know, Uju runs one of those networks, their wedding networks. You know, platforms like that can actually really help you to tap into new sources of capital that you would otherwise not be aware of or enable you to stay up to date. So I'll give you an example. Uh, the African Development Bank has, sorry, Standard Bank has launched this Africa Women uh, Fund initiative for fund managers, female fund managers, who are looking to set up their own funds to invest in different companies across key sectors, that's one. And then this other issue around cross-border funding. The reality is beyond some country-specific risks, right? The same types of things an investor in market A will be looking for, say an investor in Nigeria will be looking for, will be very similar to the same types of things an investor in South Africa will be looking for in terms of your business model and the viability of your business model. And, and I'll just break that down a bit more. So it's really around, you know, if you're running a business or a technology business or a renewable energy business, what is the technology you're looking to deploy into the market, right? And, you know, is that technology be viable? Has it been tested? You may find that the viability of one technology will depend on sort of local market conditions. So for instance, let's say the Kenyan renewable energy market is more developed and advanced than Nigeria and has created an ecosystem that makes it more likely for entrepreneurs to survive. So you may see those sorts of cross-border distinctions, but by and large, from an investor point of view, um, they're usually looking at a similar return profile. So a venture capital investor will be quite similar in their return expectations across several markets. Same with the private equity uh, uh, investor. The only thing I would also add is that your business environment will be critical. So how enabling that business environment is, things like, you know, does it create incentives for entrepreneurs? So what you'll find is that in order to raise funding, some entrepreneurs will explore setting up uh, maybe uh, a, a holding company or some sort of vehicle in another market to take advantage of maybe better tax conditions. Of course, that then introduces local content regulations. If you're setting up as a foreign entrepreneur in another country, you probably want to partner locally. So that comes with additional dynamics. But I think we should definitely build our networks and explore uh, synergies across and network more strategically and openly, particularly for female founders and SMEs. I think this is important. I think the other thing that can help in this regard is if you look at your entire value chain as a business. So if you're a coffee uh, retailer in Nigeria, you may be sourcing your coffee from Rwandan coffee farmers. So that may mean that you may actually be, tap, be able to tap into an investor base in Rwanda because a part of your value chain is creating value in another market. Um, but how will you know about the potential suppliers you can build partnerships with by being part of some sort of either Pan-African network or global network? And, and so I really encourage this whole idea of networking and networking strategically. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Rola. Okay. Um, Melissa, given your experience uh, in in uh, in the investment sector, what is it that you, what are the specific things that investors look for in the startups? What are the specific key things? So now our listeners should be taking out their books and ticking their check boxes. Do I have this? And where can I start applying for a loan or for financing? Yeah, <laughs> Melissa. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and I wish I had kind of a more uh, straightforward checklist uh, answer to that. Um, I think in general, I mean, um, as I mentioned before, our focus is really on, on companies that are able to um, serve through a product or a service uh, a certain income segment. So typically low to middle income. Um, so when we're assessing a company, um, that's one of our first criteria is understanding whether or not the product or and service is at a price point that um, that a customer of a microfinance bank, of a Finca microfinance bank specifically, um, would be able to, to purchase and use. Um, but then outside of the impact, I think, um, and this probably relates to um, many other investors in this space, I mean, we're really looking for a product or a service that has a demand. I think you see companies out there that are building things for the purpose of building things, um, but don't necessarily see, um, <clears throat> or there isn't necessarily a customer base out there that's willing to pay for a product like that. 
Um, so, and then that also kind of leads to the stage of company that we're looking at. Um, we need to see some traction. It doesn't need to be significant revenue, um, but we need to see within a pilot or a couple of pilots, um, yeah, ability or willingness to pay for this type of service and customer in demand, I think is, um, is really important from our perspective. Um, and that varies across sectors, I think, um, and across sectors and also stakeholders that are engaged in each sector. So we're, we don't have the same criteria when looking at um, like an agricultural service connecting from holder farmers to a marketplace versus um, an energy like uh, uh, a specific technology that's being sold to uh, different solar distributors. Um, so it definitely varies, um, but I think the biggest thing is market fit. Um, and then from our perspective, um, impact and, and customer segments as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, Ujua, anything to add to what uh, Melissa has said in terms of what investors are looking for in businesses from your experience and perspective? Thank you very much. Um, so I think investors, um, Melissa and Rolaki have touched on a lot of those things, but I think one particular thing that I found in my experience when I'm evaluating a company would be their management team and what's the quality of that team. Um, so what have they done? Um, what do they know? Um, do they have key roles filled? Do you have the CFO? Yeah. Who's auditing your books? Um, then I think things around governance would be the next thing. Um, you have a board of directors, and even if you do, um, who are they? Then in terms of governance, you know, look at something around on your account. Um, someone mentioned it, Grace, I think, in the previous session. Who said um, your business is your business? And so for me, it's really important that um, businesses ensure that their finances are in order. Um, there's no confusion around moving funds from one account to the other. I think another point that I want to typically look at would be how critical is the business. Um, so I see that maybe you've done um, 10 stores, maybe a mobile store where you sell something in a particular jurisdiction. Is this something you can replicate across other jurisdictions to be able to improve your impact? Or is it just something that's very unique to a particular location? And I think investors are keen to support businesses that are ready to grow and scale. And then particularly, um, impact investing is becoming very popular now. And um, even regular investors want to see that your business has some form of financial return, but particularly social and um, environmental impact. So um, how much, um, maybe how many people are you employing? Um, how many women are even in your business and things like that? Those are important questions you would typically ask to understand um, what kind of impacts the business has. And I think another thing is your business plan, which should um, be very detailed, cover all the key areas and um, how well defined have you de how well defined is your business? Um, is it commercially viable? Um, if you lose one of your anchor customers, does that mean that your business is going to go down? And what are your key milestones? Um, I think some of these things, you typically need to sit down and craft all of these things, answer these questions, tick these boxes before you even consider um, raising funding. One last thing I'll mention is around um, regulatory requirements. So um, in your country, have you, for instance, been um, paying your taxes? Do you have all the necessary permits for your business and things like that? One that people overlook would be technology. And if you're a technology company or you work with technology, does it work? If you say that, for instance, you're using a new method to sew clothes or something like that, um, has it been tried and tested? Or if it's, for instance, power generation, if you're using new technology or e-waste or something, um, recycling, um, has your technology been tested? So these are just some areas I think that um, investors look out for in addition to so many others especially the controls you put in place in your business to ensure that um, revenue doesn't get lost. Um, how do you check before paying out money from your accounts and things like that? Um, these are some things that you should pay attention to. And as an investor, I would want to be sure that you have taken into cognizance some of these things and you're abiding by them. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um And just like you've been mentioning about corporate governance and all of that, it implies that structure in the business is something that this entrepreneur should really seriously consider. Understanding the structure of your business, if it's 
a one size, you are the only, you're the accountant, you're the cleaner, you're the marketer, you're the management staff. It is an issue. I think everybody on this panel has raised that issue, which is something that I think that our viewers, our listeners should take into consideration, structuring your organization, structuring your business. Um, Rolake, can you quickly tell us if there is any uh, typical investment or funding process? What should, um, what does the investment process look like in Nigeria or with the different investment, uh, uh, I should say, structures and bodies that exist? What is a typical flow from the steps and all of that? What should these entrepreneurs expect when they go into that process? Yeah, I mean, that is, that sort of question is like, how long is a piece of string? Because it really depends. And I'm sure Uju and Melissa will agree. It depends on, is it venture capital? Is it a bank loan? Is it a grant? And they have, but I think there are certain things that are coming to them. And I, I'd like to hear what Uju and Melissa think. Maybe they can plug some of the gaps that I give when I give my. So for instance, Uju has already mentioned an investment plan, uh, a business plan. It could also be a project plan, depending on what the nature of your structure. So for instance, if your fundraising is corporate finance, i.e. you're trying to raise money at the corporate level based on your balance sheet, then you certainly want your business plan to reflect everything about your company. So Uju has mentioned. And typically the process is that you have all those, all those documents ready before you approach an investor. If you're a bigger company that can afford an investment advisor, say you don't have a strong corporate finance function in-house, and maybe that role is being done by your finance manager, or so then you want to make sure you have that structure. Alternatively, there are services, consultants that provide specialist fundraising advice that will actually handhold you through the process. So for instance, one of the things we do in our non-for-profit in Not Today, we support companies in that process. So typically you want an investment pitch because let's face it, an investor is not gonna read the entire business plan immediately. So you want a process that summarizes all the key headlines. And we've talked about what some of those key headlines, management team, technology, and then usually once they're interested, and this is usually for equity investments, once they're interested, you will typically want to execute a non-disclosure agreement or a non-disclosure, sometimes people say non-circumvention agreement, which protects you uh, because you're going to be releasing you know, proprietary business information to an external party. Once you've been able to execute that, then you can submit uh, to tailor to the investor's request. So some people will want to see your three-year audited financials, which you may have summarized. Again, if you're a new company, you may not have all these, but you certainly will have projections, your financial projections. And then there'll be a whole due diligence phase. Again, depending on the profile of the investor, that due diligence phase can take anywhere from a month to six months. And I've even seen for some larger projects, we're talking nine, 10, sometimes even a year. But I think what is common to all of these is that you have to be ready, right? Before, so you, you shouldn't be speaking to an investor and you're just trying to figure out, tell them whether your technology is proven or not. That That is not ideal, except you're literally at the early stage. And I would also encourage people to use the services of you know, incubator platforms, accelerator platforms. There are many of them who offer advisory services to businesses. And there are some investors who have a priority of handholding companies so providing both technical assistance in addition to fundraising. And, and there's so many organizations that do that. If we're now talking about very quickly approaching a Nigerian commercial bank, that comes with a whole other heap of requirements. Typically, they would not finance an early stage business. So really, the process I've just described is more for startups newer companies, emerging entrepreneurs interested in raising early stage equity investment. Banks have their own processes, their credit risk criteria, um, and then those grant giving organizations also have their own processes, but they pretty much bear similarities in terms of the investment pitch, the full business plan, your financials, and of course your permits and other certifications. And I would strongly advise that entrepreneurs actually build capacity in how to negotiate investment terms especially in this COVID climate where you may have to go back to your bank or an investor to revisit some of the terms of engagement because frankly speaking, the fundamentals of your business may have changed. And I think a lot of women entrepreneurs may not feel quite ready or know how to do so. So there are lots of tools available online that you can access. Um, all of us here on this call are also specialists helping businesses 
Um, and I think it's important to feel like you're equipped with the tools to negotiate your processes or having an advisor alongside you who can do that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alake. Uh, Melissa, what's the typical process for you guys at uh, Thinker Ventures? What does the process look like? If, if, if entrepreneurs want to go through the Thinker structure, what does the process look like? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so I think uh, a lot of the points that Relika had mentioned are, yeah, things that we look at. Um, first and foremost, we are looking at a pitch deck of a company. So I wouldn't say that's the most important document, but I, it helps you put your foot in the door um, and um, yeah, is extremely important as a first impression for, for an investor. Um, typically, once we receive that document, if it's something we're interested in, we'll get on the phone with an entrepreneur, have an hour long conversation. Um, have them pitch us, but really have most of the session be a Q&A um, so that we can dive deeper into their model um, and and really understand, um, yeah, what their their growth projections, um, how they came up with the idea of the business, where they see the opportunity. Um, and from there, have a couple more conversations with our team. Eventually, we would request access to a data room, so to a financial model, a business plan. Um, but I think kind of up up until the steps of actually requesting firm documentation, I think just having the entrepreneur be able to articulate everything in the business plan, even though it may not be written out and be perfect um, and beautiful and presentable, I think um, in conversations leading up to that request, um, that information just needs to be re readily available and you need to be prepared. Um, and then we typically would do a site visit. Um, so we're, again, we're based in DC, we're, on the continent every two or three months, usually even more than that. Um, but we would come and see the business on the ground, um, kick the tires, meet the team, all of that. Um, and typically our process can be as fast as um, as eight weeks. So we say two months, um, but that really depends on other parties at the table, how ready the business is for investment um, and, and the like. Oh. Thank you. Thank you for that input. Uh, we have a question coming through. I will just read the question and I think Ujua can help us. Ajoke is asking, why is it difficult to get loans in Nigeria, unlike in countries like the UK, despite the fact that the business is viable from the evidence-based data of the business finances and business model? Um, Ujua, can you take that for us? Thank you. Um, so African countries in general, and not just even locally in Nigeria, generally face constraints in terms of the debt of their capital market, but also in terms of the sophistication of the, should I say, the banks and what they're looking at for. But I think a similar challenge or something on the other hand is really the SMEs as well and um, the uniqueness of SMEs and how that doesn't really align with your typical commercial um, banks or, or funds. Um, and so one of the things I'll say is, for instance, banks will typically expect um, that you have collateral and um, a lot of small businesses don't actually have um, the stock collateral. And that's why loans from banks might not be as attractive or you might not even be able to assess it because already you're a small business trying to struggle. And these banks, they, they also have other means of investing like treasury bills. And if the rates are also favorable, I mean, a bank would choose to invest in a non-risk asset instead of in a business that you don't know too much about, um, someone that you don't know very well or you don't even have collateral. So I think these are one of some of the challenges. Another thing I'll say is because we don't really have, especially for SMEs, um, credit bureaus where you can actually see the credit history of some of these businesses, um, it's sometimes difficult for banks and your more formal um, commercial um, institutions to invest because you don't really know your credit history and they don't know so much about you. So I think countries, for countries that have started developing some of those databases, um, it, it makes it easier, but still it's most likely going to be other forms of funding. So whether it's angel investors, private equity, um, venture capitalists or whatever it is. Um, I think another thing, um, and particularly for female owned businesses, is that a lot of times because females are they're burdened with other responsibilities. Um, so it's difficult sometimes to be able to grow big businesses or to even formalize their businesses. 
So a lot of businesses in Africa that are led by females are usually started from home informal businesses um, where they, are, they really just don't have a lot of documentation. They don't have financial record. Um, they don't have collateral, which is also a specific issue for females because most times in some countries, females can't even own property in their name. And sometimes they can't even sign documents in their name. So I think some of these issues um, just generally affect the ability for businesses um, in developing countries to raise funding and particularly for women owned or run business who have the challenge of um, facing so things like just the perception that a woman's business is not that um, viable just because she's a woman and this is in uh, it's 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 some is historical because people felt that maybe women should be at home raising children and things like that and so when you come to a bank maybe it could be a new uh, banking office i mean he has already considered that he doesn't think you're a good customer the customer profile doesn't really meet their requirements and so that that already um, hinders you from being able to get more funding so I think that there's so many issues with the environment, um, the, the local environment, um, things like discrimination, things like other investments that these commercial banks could be making instead of writing into businesses. And these things allow, um, sometimes constrain SMEs from being able to raise money. The lack of documentation, lack of formal businesses that are registered, and lack of a credit system where you can actually check the credit worthiness of some of these businesses. Uh, thank you, thank you, Njua. That's been very, uh, that's been very insightful. Uh, just to wrap up this panel, I would like uh, each panelist, we'll start from Melissa, to just give us like two minutes. Within two minutes, just give us key any 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 summary things that you feel that entrepreneurs should know when it comes to financing. Anything that we've covered, it could be something we've already covered, but just to reiterate again so that it sinks in and they take this home. Yeah, um, I think one point that we didn't really touch on just in this panel specifically is like, uh, well, the financing ecosystem now and how businesses should approach uh, investors in the in kind of the face of COVID. I think one thing that we found um, that has been really helpful um, as we're continuing to actively invest in, and speak to new companies um, is back to the point on having a business plan is making sure that um, companies are revising that business plan and and trying to think among all this uncertainty um, how their company will look and how they want the company to look uh, in the next 12 to 18 months um, maybe showing worst case scenario but really proving to us that you've thought through um, how COVID is affecting your business on a day-to-day -day basis, um, what changes that you're making to make sure that um, when you come out on the other side, um, your business is still uh, is still operational and in a position to succeed. Um, and then, yeah, thinking about how, um, and taking a step back during this time to, to really think about um, how, yeah, how you can, set yourself up to succeed um, post COVID and be able to, um, whether or not you can access financing now, be in a position, a better position to access financing um, in the future when things start to settle down. Um, and I think also to that point, um, we've seen companies that are, um, and this was mentioned on the panel before, kind of pivoting your business model to better serve customers um, with um, all of these restrictions that are in place. Um, I think that's extremely important, um, but I also think it is important to um, to show to investors that you're you're sticking to your core competencies as well, um, and not letting certain efforts kind of distract you for what you built out and what you want your business to be um, going forward. Um, and again, really just using this time to expose any gaps that you may have in your model, um, in the customer segments that you were trying to target, but you're recognizing um, due to a lot of restrictions, they're they're no longer there. Um, and then, yeah, creating solutions um, and showing those uh, to investors as you think about how um, how you can pivot and be better placed to succeed uh, post COVID. Uh, yeah, yeah, for me, mm -hmm. well, okay, take it on. Yeah, yeah. So for me, I think the the last two things I wanted to point out is that before you even approach um, any institution like a bank, make sure you're actually at the stage where or what a bank would want to look at you. Because sometimes I feel like entrepreneurs, we can be chasing 
shadows where we're not actually focused on the right strategic investor or lending partner for our businesses. That was the number one thing. And then finally, um, just this acronym might actually help. It's ERRC, eliminate, reduce, raise, and create. So in this COVID era, what are those excesses in your business that you can eliminate? What are those things that you don't really need that you can do away with? So you need a really lean model. And then reduce. Again, can you try and reduce some of your overhead costs instead of using three or four rooms in the office? Maybe you can switch to using one room to save on energy costs. R, raise. Can you raise new types of ways of working? Um, a lot of people are working virtually. This may save on transportation costs, for instance, for some of your consultants or for those additional fringe benefits. Even after COVID, you don't necessarily have to go back to working from brick and mortar, an actual office. You can actually go virtual for 50% of the week. And then create. We really need to be looking at creating new types of customer markets. And even with our existing markets of customers, are there new products that we can roll out that will help people cope with the current climate? So I really want to encourage all female entrepreneurs, look, the road may seem challenging, but there is no better time to be a female entrepreneur because I tell you, there's a plethora of female focused funds and lending initiatives there. You just have to be ready to take advantage of it when those opportunities materialize. Oh, thank you. But you want any, any, any last words to, to, to share with the audience? Yes, yes. Uh, my final points, just five things I would typically look out for or that I would tell someone that is my friend, if you're thinking of doing investment ready or going to seek funding, one, I would say integrity. So you need to be upfront about your situation to your investors, um, disclose everything accurately and ensure that you're being very true to yourself and to your business, because that's the one way that you're going to get other recommendations in the future. The second thing I would say is really customer being customer centric, so having a deep understanding of what the micro market is and who your customer is and what exactly your customer needs. And if you're actually meeting the customer at their right price point, because you can't be offering someone that earns $100 a product that is about $50 a month when you know they have to feed, they have to go to the hospital, they have to educate their children. So I think being very clear um, on who your customer is and dimensioning it. Um, the third would be really having a clear business plan and revenue model. Um, I mean, if you're going to speak to anyone, they want to know where your money is coming from. So um, are you going to be charging people on a daily basis, um, on a monthly basis? How exactly are you getting money and is your money coming to this business? Um, the first thing I would say is really about your network and um, when you're trying to approach investors. Um, I would advise that you go through someone you know, someone that potentially has even supported your business. You don't want to go, go to someone that did not invest in your business and people say, okay, why not? So really, just that one introduction, someone that knows you and being personal, don't go straight to funding. Just try and understand the investor and then down the line, potentially you um, ask for funding. And I think the last thing is really that um, it's going to require a lot of patience and preparation. There's really no shortcut um, to raising funding or to being viable and to keeping your business afloat. So at any point in time, don't be in a hurry. Look at your strategy, put in the time and the work. And at the end of the day, I'm sure you'll come out Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Juwa. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Rolake. Very interesting points have been raised. And like uh, like I mentioned, this video is going to be available on the Clean Tech Hub page, on the Sinaloo page, and even on YouTube channel. You can watch. And if you still have questions, you can still keep sending them in the comment section. And our speakers will, will take a day or two, we'll send the questions to them. They can respond, we'll forward the response to them. And they'll be sharing their details and business pages so that you can follow, like, and subscribe for whatever platforms that they are using. Rolake, it's been a pleasure having you. Melissa Ujunwa, it's been a pleasure. Isioma Oge from the Thank first Kem. And even um, Chidi, it's been very lovely having you guys here. And this is a miracle. Women are effective. We are finishing on time. I tell you, we are, <laughs> we are very effective and efficient. So I don't know what all that noise is about. So we are actually finishing on time. And it's been very lovely. We're very happy to those who have been able to join us, keep in touch, like with all the speakers have mentioned, 
We know that this is a difficult time, but keep your head afloat. There's a silver lining. There are a lot of resources that are available and reach out if you need help. So thank you once again to all the speakers who came on board. Thank you, Chidi. And have a good night from us here in DRC. We're one hour ahead, so it's almost my bedtime. So thank you very much for coming on board. Thank you, Melissa, for joining us. Thank you, Uju, and bye-bye.